Hi again, everyone. I am super happy to be with you this morning. We are now going to see how to make cities greener and smarter with mobility. As you may know, transportation is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions in cities. To achieve net zero targets and sustainable development goals, cities really need to transform. And we are going to see right now how they can do it. Don't forget, you can ask your questions all along the session. Uh, you go to the VivaTech app, you select the tab in the drop down menu titled Interactive Session with Slido, and then you select Stage 2, and you can ask your questions that the moderator will ask in the end. Please welcome Vincent Satcher and all of his guests. Good morning, all. Happy to see you so numerous in this room. So I'm Vincent Schachter. I'll be your moderator today. I'm also the CEO of a startup at the interface between logistics and, uh, and electric mobility. And with me today, I have Cécile Texier, who is VP Sustainability at Alstom. I have Gurjan Caracas, CEO of TOG. Thank you. Hello. Frédéric Tranquiem, um, Chief um, Executive VP Digital and Innovation at RATP. Hi, everybody. And Christophe Pemira, Head of uh, EMEA uh, at uh, Uber. Hello. All right. So we're here to discuss green mobility in cities. But before we even start, what exactly are the goals? What are you trying to achieve? Uh, by making mobility greener and smarter in cities. Cécile, can you help us with that? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, for me, a sustainable city is a city that is making the best use of its resources in terms of uh, space, in terms of energy. And it is generally accepted that in order to reduce the impact of transport, we need to go through an avoid, shift, improve approach. Uh, sometimes we jump quite quickly to improve, but we need to go through the other two steps. So first, avoid. Uh, it means organizing the territory uh, in a way that uh, we are reducing transport flows, uh, reducing distances, uh, mutualizing uh, the, the, the flows. Uh, and we have seen emerging recently the concept of the 15-minute city, which is applied in Paris. So it's a way to organize the city uh, to secure that all the daily services, uh, everything you may need, is. Uh, uh, not, not far away, uh, within 15 minutes walk or uh, a bike ride. Uh, so once that is established, uh, you need to go through the shift approach, so uh, shifting to low carbon transport modes. Uh, and especially, uh, I'm, I'm from Alstom, so uh, representing the rail manufacturing. And so uh, in this respect, uh, metro and trams are very efficient, very efficient in terms of space use. Uh, for example, with the metro line uh, that is 9 meters uh, wide, you can uh, transport uh, 50,000 people per hour. In order to do the same with a road, you would like uh, 20 times more space. In terms of energy efficiency, uh, metro and trams are also very efficient, uh, 5 to 10 times more efficient than any alternatives, even electrical cars. And because rail is already electrified, it is very low carbon in terms of emissions. In average, 20 grams of CO2 per passenger kilometer worldwide. But uh, with uh, low carbon electricity, like in France, we can go down to 2 grams of CO2 per passenger kilometer. And this is well recognized by IEA, the International Energy Agency, which is saying that in order to get to net zero uh, carbon in transport, we need to push significantly public transport to increase the modal share by 40% by 2030 and even double by 2050. So significant work ahead of us. And this will bring additional benefits in terms of safety, in terms of air pollution, in terms of socioeconomic development. Uh, for example, uh, currently we are installing the Line 7 in Santiago of Chile. 
uh, and from uh, the two ending point, to, I mean from terminal to terminal, we're going to cut the travel time by two, and this is really changing people's life. I mean, you, you, you're saving the people one hour per day, so very significant impact. Also providing access uh, to a large population, and especially women, there is a gender aspect in access to public transport, because when in a family, when you have one car, it's usually the man driving, and so the lady is using public transport. And we've seen from the post-mortem analysis of some of our projects, like the tramway in Casablanca, that women are actually using the tramway very largely. Uh, and so uh, doing public transport project is providing them uh, more, more uh, access to safe and comfortable transport. Um, I don't want to be too we'll, long. We'll say more about behaviors yeah. in a minute. But since a lot of the solutions you mentioned, Cécile, our public transport solution, in fact, uh, you know, most of them. Frédéric, um, what do you think, which solutions in the ten, last 10 years you think have most contributed to the goals that Cécile just presented? Okay. So um, as of today, moving first, moving to a public transportation rather than your car is a way to make mobility greener. So for me, that's really the key goal when we're talking about mobility. Um, when we're talking about solution, the one we see uh, look, uh, looking in the past, the first one is uh, the transformation we make in our trains. So for example, at RATP Group, we are shifting our trains from uh, old generation to new generation, and more or less we are saving about 20% uh, efficiency. So that, that goes energy efficiency, so that goes about the green, green gas effect for sure. So the train, swapping them. And the other one in our area would be the buses. So where we use, as everybody, uh, fossil fuel buses. And we are now uh, shifting to electric buses, most, so about 50% in some cases with hydrogen, and also shifting to uh, biogas buses. So here is a, a huge shift. And, and of course, the greenhouse, eff the, the greenhouse effect is getting really lower and lower. So that goes for the past. Thank you, Frédéric. So this is public transport, and it so happens that it's already electrified. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Christophe, from the point of view of Uber, which is not public transport, at least not in the classical definition of the term, and uh, didn't start as electrified, what do you think are the contribution of a company such as Uber to past changes, uh, past progress towards these goals, and then, you know, what are the things that you thought, you, you might have thought would happen 10 years ago and didn't happen? Okay, so I hope you can uh, hear me well. So uh, I, I think our vision is really in line with uh, what I've just heard, uh, is going electric, uh, low emissions, uh, etc. Uh, the world that we are uh, envisioning is really to have a, a multimodal uh, approach. Uh, where cars will be shared and electric. So you do not need to own a car to use a car. Basically, that's what we want to do. And we see it as a world where cars will be electric. And uh, last week, we made some uh, very clear commitments in London towards a zero uh, emission uh, fleet in uh, Europe uh, by uh, 2030. Um, so that's what we want to do. Uh, I think it's a, it's a teamwork, so it's not uh, Alstom, RATP, uh, etc. finding the, the, the solutions. Uh, from our point of view, what we want to do is to, is to provide uh, options to the consumers and to corporates uh, in, uh, in our various uh, markets. And these options, once again, it's electric cars, it is uh, but also multimodal uh, options. So we want to have like uh, public transportations, micro mobility options, and potentially also encourage just the fact that people can walk. Sometimes it uh, it can work. Uh, when I look backwards and uh, and also I look at the at the future, ten years ago it was the very early days of uh, of Uber. So uh, I think the company has grown uh, super fast. I think ride sharing and this idea that you do not have to own a car now is very clearly in uh, people's mind. Uh, very clearly, there are things 
that we would have liked to, uh, to see going faster, like uh, autonomous vehicle, it's coming. It's coming, and here we are going to have uh, uh, various partners joining the platform to really uh, add to this uh, multimodal uh, solution. Thank you, Christophe. And uh, we'll go more into that in a moment. Uh, so I know your company has an integrated approach to developing urban mobility with devices, digital platforms, and vehicles. Can you tell us more about those type of solutions? Yeah, sure. Definitely. Uh, first of all, um, the title of this session is Mobility, and Mobility Matters. So that already um, indicates to a huge transformation. Some years ago, we would say transportation matters. Some years ago, we would say automotive industry matters. So and this is already what we see uh, happening. So what is happening right now is that with the development of the technology, which is basically the IOTS, on one side, the technology on the power train with lithium-ion batteries, electric vehicles on the other side, and uh, with the artificial intelligence. So the spaces, they are flowing into each other. They are melting into each other. So we, our car formerly becoming more and more intelligent and becoming more and more a smart device so that it becomes a living space. So if you are moving from A to B in the huge cities, and in, in Turkey we have one of the largest crowded, crowded cities uh, in the world, so we would like to have the seamless experience, the living space together with us. Uh, and in order to design this, what we did was we simply started with the user, because the user needs the value, the user has the pain points, and if we uh, did the analysis, we have identified 350 user experience scenarios. Out of them, 40 have been for them very much liked with multi degree high where they said, hey, we would like to have it. I can even pay for that. And this is including, for example, like Christoph said, the multimodal uh, intermodal mobility. This is the energy efficiency. This is the move from A to B without any interruptions. And, and this is what we are doing, putting the user into the center, using the state of the art of the technology within our DNA uh, being grown up in Turkey as a company, we have the welcoming culture, the hospitality, and also the community approach. We are combining both best parts of Eastern culture and the Western culture to provide solutions for our users. Thank you for putting the user center of everything. So this is a, a great transition. I think it's clear that behaviors yeah. have changed in the last 10 years. At least uh, as someone who lives in Paris, or same thing for Rome and San Francisco, for example, it's changed tremendously. The urban landscape is different. Now, what would you say since multimodality is critical to the shift in solutions that we're talking about, what would you say the three top changes in user behaviors that you have observed and, measures are, uh, and measured are in, in Paris? Um. The key point when we want to go to a greener mobility is for sure change of behaviors because you can have uh, a car, you can have a train, you can have a bike. But uh, for example, in France, when you want to uh, make a, a, a travel, I'd say less than seven kilometers, in 65% of the case, you, use, you still use your car. You could use your bike, you could walk, but the behavior is not there yet at the large scale, and we need to change that. The good thing is that it's starting to change. Uh, I was uh, discussing with a young woman, let's name her uh, Sophie. Uh, she lives in Paris. Uh, she's 22, and she uh, wanted to uh, visit her sister, who is currently living in Roma. And no way she would use a plane. It was not possible. So you can see the behavior, the, the behavior changing with a youngster, which is a very good new. You can also see that in Paris. And when you go outside, there are many, many more bikes than two or three years ago. And really, the behavior is changing. The question we need to address as the, as the players in, in, the, in this field in how do we help the change? And uh, from our perspective, it's about offering the travelers a seamless, top-notch tra travel experience. Because you don't want to take your car or the bus or the train. You want to go for 
point A to point B. That's what you want to achieve. So we need to, uh, to make that effortless for them. So um, it's about multi-mobility, as you mentioned. So uh, the bike, the e-scooters, it can be the cars in some cases. It would be the train. So some part of the offer are here and they are growing. That's, that's a change that's coming. The thing that's not there yet is to make it seamless. So uh, uh, to make it seamless, you need to have the people cooperating. For example, if uh, I use my bike to go to a subway station, I need to have an infrastructure to park my bike. Okay, and that's, that means that's one way the infrastructure needs to change. And the other thing we need to do is to help the traveler prepare for uh, his journey and maybe update his path while he's doing it. And uh, we are convinced that the mass applications, so mobility as a service applications like uh, Bonjour within RATP Group is a key lever to achieve that because you will be at home, you will be deciding which path, which uh, mode you will use, and that's, that's the way we will lever it. Yeah, one, one striking point in what you're saying is uh, five years ago, similar conversation. I think you might have told us about the lack of sharing of data and open data infrastructure. And I'm not hearing this as an obstacle now. Can you, um, I'm, I'm hearing about infrastructure to park the bike. I'm hearing about existing software. So do you believe there is still a data and software issue or that part has advanced enough? Yeah, if, I, if I'm trying to think of the roadblocks to go there, okay, there is the, the awareness of the people that will come over time. It's already changing. You have the availability of the different modes. Some are already there. They need to develop. Uh, Autonomous vehicle could be an opportunity in some low density areas to complete the offer, to really be able to offer the seamless. About the software, it's okay. Um, the issue we are facing in France is that, I, I mentioned the mass, uh, mass applications at the key level. Uh, in France, it's the, there is no viable business model for uh, the mass suppliers. So it's something that uh, the government is working on currently, but we need to help those suppliers, those mass suppliers, to, to have a viable business model so that the offer can go higher and it can help transform the behaviors. Okay, great. So you mentioned incentives and, um, and making it possible for the various players to have sustainable business models, right? So I think this is probably a critical point for the for the uh, you know the business side, but also the users. Cecile, do you see what do you see as critical in incentivizing the the change we want to keep incentivizing in, in user behavior? Uh, well, I fully agree with Frederic that we need to think in terms of door-to-door -door mobility. We cannot just think at station to station. Uh, so for us, it's uh, really critical, and so we are doing a, a bit in, uh, in this move. First, we see our customer asking more and more to uh, adapt uh, our trains, our uh, metros, tramways, to secure that we can onboard bicycles. For example, we have more and more uh, uh, rank uh, for bikes within the trains. Huh? You see it in the suburban trains in Paris, for example. And also, uh, we are convinced that uh, we, should, uh, uh, we should ensure that we are promoting the access to the station. Uh, and at Alstom, we have just uh, signed a partnership with an NGO that is called Walk21, that is promoting uh, walking. And we will work with them in order to analyze the way people are moving to the station. Are the access walkable? Uh, because we know that this is critical to the success of um, public transport projects. We've experiencing uh, in some countries that by changing the, the the path to get to the station, we could significantly raise the, uh, the the number of people that were using public transport. And the shift is actually happening. And today in Paris, I don't know if you know, but it's 90% of the travel, the journeys that are done either biking, walking, about 60% the two of them. 30% uh, public transport, and the rest is uh, cars. But it's very minimum for the moment. Speaking of cars and the share of cars, um, you, I would assume Uber measures uh, very precisely 
part of user's behavior just you know, by getting the data for all, those, uh, for all those rides, Uber rides. Can you share with us some striking changes in behavior that you have observed over the last few years? Of course, so, uh, so data is, uh, is, uh, is king. And by the way, we are ready to share our data with the cities to make sure that uh, we are collectively smart uh, on the areas where we can uh, uh, implement uh, charging stations uh, for uh, car drivers. Um, I think the use of data is already helping us optimize the trips. So the consumption on a given uh, trip is a function of uh, number of kilometers of uh, miles, elevation speed, and we have uh, our algorithm that are, that are really working to reduce as much as possible uh, the uh, carbon emission uh, on these trips. And at the end of the day, what we see is that we want to help the drivers. So at Uber, we want to help the drivers first uh, to get access to an electric uh, vehicle. And here we have a $800 million fund worldwide to help them transition to uh, EVs. We are, and that's quite an important uh, amount of, uh, of money for that transition. We are also working very closely to help them answer to their needs. So some drivers will want to rent, to lease a car. And we have, for example, partnerships with Hertz and Tesla. So we are bringing 25,000 uh, Teslas to uh, EMEA via Hertz to get our drivers uh, equipped, number one. Number two, some drivers at some point uh, may want to buy their cars, and mm. here we have real uh, partnerships with car manufacturers. And so then on the, on the data, just I think it's quite important, we are also using machine learning to help drivers define when and where they should recharge their car during the day. Right, great. So electrification seems to be very important. But if I go back to the user behavior there, are people you know, doing more or fewer rides, smaller rides, knowing that cars, I'll take Paris as an example. Paris is not very car friendly, is it? Uh, that has changed for the last few years. At least that's what some of the uh, Parisians think. Have you observed that? And has that have an Im had an impact uh, positively or negatively on rides? So, so what I can uh, observe, and that's public information because it's in our financials, is that our business is growing. So uh, for the part that I control, like ride sharing is growing. And then the electric part of the equation is also growing. And I think what is interesting is that Europe is leading the way. So today, when we look at our platform in our key European cities, 12% of the kilometers driven already are electric. So yes, Uber is growing. We are growing in terms of sheer volume. And we are also growing with today more than 20,000 uh, EVs that are on the road in, uh, in Europe. Do users prefer an electric Uber to a non-electric Uber? What we see is it's always a question of supply and demand. And on the demand side, Europe, again, is leading the way. So we have seen a great demand from consumers, but also from corporates. We have lots of corporations, like big consulting firms, uh, media, financial companies, that want to use uh, green solutions for their employee, uh, for their employee uh, transportation. And we were, Europe was the first region at Uber to launch Uber Green, which is an answer to that demand with both consumers and corporates uh, wanting to go green and towards a zero carbon emission world. Thank you. User again, what would be your view? You mentioned uh, user behaviors, touch points, multimodality. Can you share with us one view of the ideal uh, user journey going from point A to point B? in a city that you would equip with your solutions. OK. Um, I would like to pick up the point with the changes in the behavior. Um, if you think of the social media generation, 
they are resisting to step into the old car. By the way, uh, Christoph, if Paris doesn't like cars, we'll provide soon smart devices, maybe different. <laughs> so that point, that point that the young generation, uh, since they are not connected, are resisting into being in the car, um, gave us the thought. And during our user research, we identified the following. So, um, if you ask the people sitting on the passenger side, after 20 minutes they are bored and they would like to do something else. So and if you ask them what you would like to do, so since because of the paradigms they don't know what to say. So we observe them, we understand them with, for example, thinking, reading their minds with metaphors. They would like to do shopping. They would like to do reading. They would like to watch their NFTs, trade them. Yeah. So, um, and um, these are not possible with today's infrastructure. So what did we do? Solution. We have a side-to-side -side screen, a one-fifth television, touch screen. So you can partition it. So that side-to-side -side screen is the user interface side. That needs a powerful processor. That needs an efficient design of the entire uh, chips and processor sets that you have the, not only the speed, the memory, the alignment, everything, like an app store. Yeah? So, and that made us to design our own computer. So a domain, I mean, the engineers would say it's a domain control computer. So we call it an info, infotainment domain control computer. So what you can do is, for example, if you sit in our smart device, you can first of all configure it every minute, every day, if you want 20 times. So on one corner, on one window, you can put your um, movies. On the other corner, you can put your artificial intelligence radio. By the way, it's also one of the other solutions. So we have taught the computer in each category more than thousands of songs. And from the learned ones, the computer is composing songs and is able to stream infinitely long without royalty. Can you imagine jazz, Turkish classic music, classic music, pop music, everything. So, and that, that's a completely different category. So we are, we are redefining in that sense what the mobility itself is. So it is a living space. And uh, the intermodal mobility is the simplest thing. Uh, but on the other side, we al also allow our users to pay their taxes from the smart device. Because you, you go and enter into the e-government.org. Uh, you know, I was going to comment that we, you reminded us that mobility is entertainment, but then you, you started talking about paying your taxes while you're on the go. Yeah, yeah that's, that's entertainment too. Yeah, but, yes. but at the end, you as user, you want to have fun, you want to have an optimized use of your time. That's the most valuable thing in our lives, time, time, and time, and then hassle-free. Do you think there is a generational divide? You mentioned, uh, you know, there young is. people not wanting to own a car. Un un unfortunately, there is. And, and the, the point is, in that case, um, the truth and the belief in what happens with the data. Mm -hmm. yeah, there is a generation, uh, my generation, for example, they want to read everything and sign it five times before they release. So even though all the data is sanitized and there is no one-to-one -one personal relation, it's also legally not uh, possible. So on the other side, the young generation, they don't even care. Yeah, they give, I mean, are more easy to give away their data because they get something for this data. And this something for this data is not simply alone achieved by talk as a company. It's the ecosystem. This point has not been uh, mentioned at all. The ecosystem we are building right now is um, together with the startups. So you remember the use case scenario and the, the examples I gave to you? So you need blockchain technology, you need gamification, you need fintech, you need right. insurtech, you need every derivatives of the cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. Is that available in the automotive industry? None. None. So what happens? We need to go to the startups, and that's why we are here. We have been yes last year here, this year here, we have been to Las Vegas to go see yes. Last year, the year before, mm -hmm. and, and this is the way how we build it up. So, if some right. uh, infrastructure platforms are open with their APIs, with their SDKs, there are lots of companies here. They would love to build services on top of that. The thing is, the critical thing is, be open, open, open your data, open your system, 
to the startups companies. Great. So change is happening. Absolutely. But is it happening fast enough for the goals? We, we got reminded at the beginning what the goals were and climate change is happening. So we talked about behavioral changes and incentives. There is another part to this. It's not only incentives. Sometimes it's coercive, it's regulation. Um, Cecile, can you think what is the single most important piece of regulation or policy that you think has triggered change in the last 10 years? And then I'm going to ask you the question about the next 10 years, what could happen? Regulation. Uh, the piece of policy that has uh, pushed uh, sustainable mobility in the last years? Yes. Oh, that's not an easy one. Uh, well, I think the move has happened naturally and maybe more pushed by the people themselves than uh, by the regulation. Uh, we've seen also the commitment, uh, thanks to the Paris Agreement, I, I think the Paris Agreement was a major step forward, and then it cascaded from the countries to the cities to the companies, and so we are all sharing these uh, carbon targets, and it's a common goal that we have. So that's, I think, for the past, for the future, and in, in my business especially, I think something that would be really important is that we integrate in public tender sustainable uh, development criteria because it is possible, but it's not mandatory. And so sometimes we, we tend to, to go for the easy option, the not the most efficient, when there are actually options to do more, to be more energy efficient, to be eco-designed, to think at the end of life, to optimize the system at the, at the global level, to be more integrated with other modes of transport. But this needs to be anticipated early enough and integrating in, in the tender. So that, that would be my recommendation. So not too much coercion, a, a little bit. <laughs> yes, just enough. <laughs> just enough to get them to move. Okay, let's... Uh, Christophe, do you have any comments on regulatory aspects, knowing that Uber is a North American company operating everywhere, including in Europe, and Europe is, as usual, at the cutting edge of regulation. So what's, uh, what's your feel and what did you learn from one side and you can apply to the other or not? I think, the, so first in terms of policy making, we have seen uh, some cities like London, Lisbon or Amsterdam taking some serious steps uh, to make uh, electric cars either uh, compulsory in some areas or having some additional price tag for uh, uh, usual cars when they go to the city center. So I think the, the, the city policies are super uh, important to push, uh, to really push the, the, the trend towards uh, electric cars, number one. And again, cities like London, Lisbon, and Amsterdam are clear benchmarks. But it's not only that. It's also policies that help uh, people uh, acquire an electric vehicle at a cheaper price, because I think also what's important when we look uh, at our business and when we look at our drivers, it is very important to have a second-end market. So I think by encouraging the first-end market, then we are growing also the second-end uh, market. So it's really like a price tag on using uh, cars uh, that are like fuel cars uh, in, the, in city centers and really developing a second-end market that would be super helpful. Thank you. So let's, uh, we have uh, little time left, two minutes. So let's switch on to the future and to enabling technologies. Um, I'm going to ask each of you to mention the top one, two, three technologies that you think might be most impactful in creating that uh, smart green mobility in cities of the future. And um, I'm going to start with you, Frédéric. Thank you. Um, we we uh, elaborated quite a bit about the fact that we need to change the behaviors. So in the future, uh, some stuff that is coming will be more mature. I mentioned the, the mass applications. So we need to tackle the regulation. But th that's not a technical breakthrough. That's a regulation breakthrough. Uh, we mentioned some of the technologies, so the bike, the train, the buses. The, the one I see coming would be autonomous vehicle. It's not dead, it will strike back. 
Okay. Uh, because in some areas, to really offer the seamless offers, especially in uh, low density areas, having a vehicle able to pick you where you are and take you where you want to be might be easier if it's autonomous. Or if you take the example of buses in the deep night, so between two and five uh, at night time, when the autonomous vehicle will be mature enough, it will be easier to offer that to the passenger. So autonomous vehicle will strike back. And uh, you mentioned the regulation uh, evolving. There was one small thing that changes last summer. An international regulation changed. It's no more mandatory to have a driver in a vehicle. OK, so it allows autonomous vehicle to go when mature enough with no driver. So it really will uh, enhance the value of the autonomous vehicle at the end of the day. So my bet would be that, autonomous vehicle. Thanks a lot. We're out of time, actually. So, you know, if we have one more minute, just very briefly, all of you mentioned one or two bullet points on future technologies. Uh, for me, what's, what's uh, exciting me uh, a lot is what we showcased uh, last week in, uh, in London. It's about machine learning, using our data to provide drivers with the right uh, information on when and where to recharge their cars. For me, I'm uh, blown away. Thank you. For me, I would quote uh, automated operation. So with up-to-date signaling system, you can uh, um, increase significantly the capacity of transport uh, by reducing the headway between two trains. And you can also optimize the energy consumption of the system globally, so that's the future. And another important point is the impact from infrastructure, because whenever you build a new line, there are impacts with the, the concrete and the tracks you are putting there. Uh, and we've been working, for example, on uh, uh, Grand Paris Express uh, to have specific new solutions for tracks that are made from recycled steel and steel uh, built in electrical arc furnace, which is significantly reducing the emission of the infrastructure. And I think that's really something to look at for the future. Thank you, Cecile. And finally? Seamless, green, and personalized mobility. And the next big thing in our business will be in a completely different area, according to our opinion. That will be the smart contracting with blockchain. We need, we need a solution for the ecosystem subsystems to connect with a one single sign-on. And this, so far, is only available with the smart contracting. Well, thanks a lot uh, to all of you. And uh, please join me in a round of applause for uh, all the panelists. So.